The case you're about to see is fictional, but the procedure is authentic. The characters are played by actors, but the jury is selected from members of the public. Members of the jury, the charge, as you have heard, is murder. Let me add that it is a particularly cowardly form of murder, as the weapon used was poison. The prosecution case will be that on the 25th of September last year, Arthur Holland, who is only 17 years old, but nevertheless criminally responsible, did murder his stepmother, Mrs. Marjorie Holland, by feeding her a number of mushrooms which he knew to be of a poisonous species. Are you Dr. Philip Belmore and you live at uh, 5 Birdbrook Avenue, Fulchester? Yes. How many years have you been the family doctor attending the Holland family? Eleven years. Could you tell the court, please, what happened, if you can cast your mind back, to the early hours of September the 26th, last year? I remember it clearly. At five minutes to midnight, I was woken by the telephone. It was young Arthur Holland, the defendant. He said that he'd come home, found his stepmother, that she'd fallen down the stairs, and that he believed she'd hit her head. I asked if she was conscious. He said no. I told him not to move her, to call an ambulance, and said that I would be there as quickly as possible. And how long did it take you? Fifteen minutes. I arrived before the ambulance. What did you find when you arrived? Mrs. Holland, Mrs. Marjorie Holland, was lying at the foot of the staircase. She was unconscious and had been secreting saliva. I also noticed that her pupils were constricted and that she was perspiring heavily. There was also lacrimation, uh, watering of the eyes. And what did you diagnose was wrong with her? The symptoms were very similar to those of cholera, except for the constriction of the pupils. I immediately suspected a form of alkaloid poisoning. Her pulse rate bore this out. It was extremely low. Were there any injuries to her head? None. Let me ask you about her position when you found her. How exactly was she lying? On her right side, her head resting on the lobby carpet. But her buttocks were higher up on the bottom stairs. And how were her legs? They were curled in quite tightly. Did you see any physical injuries on her at all? None. And what did you deduce from that? That she had not fallen down the stairs. Her symptoms were consistent with alkaloid poisoning. Would that alone have caused her to have become unconscious? Yes. Did it surprise you that the defendant had said she's fallen downstairs and he believed she'd hit her head? Yes. I saw nothing whatsoever to support that belief. Could you explain to the court what alkaloid poisoning is? Yes. It's poisoning caused by various organic bases which are found in plants, including fungi. What happened after you found Mrs. Holland? I asked Arthur, the defendant, if she'd eaten anything within the last few hours. He said that he'd picked her some mushrooms, but that he'd gone out and didn't know at what time she'd eaten them. And did he say how many he'd picked for her? Nine or ten. He couldn't be precise. I asked if he'd eaten any. He said no. I asked if he had a specimen. He said yes and went upstairs to his bedroom to fetch it. And what did you do? I telephoned Fulchester General Hospital and spoke to Dr. Anderson of the poisoning unit. While I was giving him details, the ambulance arrived. And did the defendant bring the mushroom to you? Yes. It was in a waxed paper bag, the kind that breakfast cereals are enclosed in. And what did this mushroom look like? It was small and ivory colored and heavily stained with red. Dr. Belmore, what do you mean, stained? I mean, it was a biological characteristic. I see. Thank you, Mr. Markson. My lord. Then what did you do? I travelled in the ambulance with the mushroom to the hospital. Arthur came with me, of course. Couldn't you have treated Mrs. Holland yourself? No. No, I couldn't. The only drug that has any effect is atropine, and I don't keep it. Is that normal? Perfectly, my lord. Because alkaloid poisoning is caused by plants, which include fungi, one hardly ever comes across it in towns. Yes, I see. You. My lord, did Mrs. Holland regain consciousness at all in the ambulance? She did not. How would you describe the defendant's state? Was he anxious? He appeared very calm. Did he say anything to you in the ambulance about the mushrooms his stepmother had eaten? Yes. He said, I thought they were edible. I identified them as St. George's mushrooms. Did that remark surprise you? No, because I knew that mushrooms were his hobby. What happened when you got to the hospital? Mrs. Holland's pulse was extremely low. I stayed with her while Dr. Anderson gave a venous injection of two milligrams of atropine. Only shortly afterwards, however, she died. And what did you do with the mushroom? 
I gave it to Sister Crippen. An unfortunate name for a sister in the poisoning unit. Uh, one more question, Dr. Belmore. How soon after consumption of those poisonous mushrooms would these symptoms have occurred? Very rapidly. Within minutes to a maximum of two hours. Thank you, Dr. Belmore. Dr. Belmore, <clears throat> you say you saw nothing whatsoever to support the belief that she had fallen downstairs. That's correct. Yet she was lying at the foot of the stairs. Yes. To a layman, might it not look as though she had fallen down them? Her symptoms were not consistent with any fall. With respect, that is a doctor's opinion. I suggest these symptoms might not appear significant to a layman. Salivation, perspiration, constricted pupils. They're hardly as dramatic as a body lying at the bottom of a staircase. There were no injuries, and certainly there wasn't one to her head. The defendant did only say he believed she'd hit her head. Yes. Well, given the fact that she was unconscious, wasn't this a natural assumption? For a layman, perhaps. The defendant is only 17, Dr. Belmont. When he brought the mushroom to you and you saw the red stains on the flesh, did he say anything? No. I put it to you, he said, it wasn't that colour earlier on this evening. He made no comment like that at all. I see, he just gave it to you mutely. He may have said something. But you can't remember. He did not say what you suggested. Did his calmness help you? It certainly didn't hinder me. But did it help you? Yes. In what way? He told me about the mushrooms directly, I asked. Fetched the specimen. Told me all I needed to know. Are you saying that he didn't panic and therefore helped you to deal with the emergency? It was no more than I expected. I suggest there wasn't any more you could have expected. I'd have welcomed being told earlier about the possibility of poisoning. In such cases, time is crucial. You might have welcomed it. I suggest that it's already been established you had no reason to expect it. I can only repeat, she did not give me the impression that she'd fallen downstairs. That, that is hardly surprising, Doctor. The lady was unconscious. Was Mrs. Holland in good health up until this incident? Apart from a weight problem, yes. She was very obese. I had urged her to eat less. And might this obesity have caused some heart disease or strain? She'd never complained to me of any. Had she ever approached you with uh, stomach ache, feverishness, or any symptoms you might associate with poisoning? No. Thank you, Dr. Belmore. You have been most helpful. Are you Dr. Edwin Harper from the Police Forensic Science Laboratory at Manchester? I am. And on the 26th of September last year, did you perform a post-mortem examination on Mrs. Marjorie Holland at Fulchester Hospital? I did. The reason being that the local pathologist was not experienced in mushroom poisoning. It is a uh, specialised field. And could you tell the court the result of that examination? Yes. Mrs. Holland had died from cardiovascular collapse the collapse of the blood vessels around the heart due to the presence in the system of muscarine, a toxic alkaloid. In her stomach, I found a quantity of partially digested mushrooms. Chemical analysis showed that these were the source of the muscarine. Were you able to identify the species? Yes. From microscopic examination of the stomach contents and also from an uneaten specimen of the <coughs> mushroom, it was possible to identify it as Inocybe patuiardi or the red-staining Inocybe. It is deadly poisonous. Were you able to determine how many of these species had been eaten altogether? It would have to be an estimate. There was evidence that she'd vomited some of the contents. However, from putting together pieces of partially digested mushroom, I would say 25. 25? Yes. Inocybe patuiadi is a very small mushroom and the muscarine content is very low. It would have needed at least half a pound of mushrooms to produce a fatality. Could eight or nine of these mushrooms produce a fatality? Not in a healthy adult. The victim would have to be a child or already affected by heart or lung disease. And in your examination of Mrs. Holland, did you find any evidence of such disease? No, I did not. Thank you, Dr. Harper. That's all. <clears throat> Dr. Harper, when you say 25 mushrooms would have to be eaten, are you basing that on the average size of a fruit body? Uh, more on the average wet weight, which would be about 10 grams. The cap diameter would be approx 3 centimetres. Do mushrooms vary very much in size within a species? Not greatly. It uh, depends on their stage of growth and the circumstances in which they're growing. 
So if all the mushrooms the defendant had picked were twice that size, uh, might not the figure of 25 be reduced to nearer 12? The uneaten specimen I examined was of average size and weight. I made tests on it and discovered it contained approximately 4 milligrams of muscarine. It would take 100 milligrams of muscarine to produce the fatal results. 4 milligrams of muscarine into 100 milligrams is 25. Quite. But could you tell the size and weight of the mushrooms eaten? Yes, from putting together pieces of stem and cap which are distinguishable, I would say all about the same size and weight. How much is known about the quantity of muscarine in one fruit body of this species? Oh, very little. It really depends on geographic variables. One Swiss paper quotes a fresh specimen concentration of 0.04%, but there's no such figure for this country. But could it also vary geographically within the British Isles? Yes, it is quite possible. Well, I suggest that your estimates are wild guesses. I'd say I am correct within one milligram of muscarine per fruit body. It's a difficult test. Yes, there are four or five different configurations of the same poison. Did you work on it alone? I came to those estimates on my own, yes. You said there was evidence of vomiting. This would surely have disposed of a lot of the stomach contents. Yes, but I was able to piece together ten fruit bodies. Uh, mushrooms are very slow to be digested. So apart from a rather maverick test in what is a little known field, there's really no sure way of knowing how many mushrooms were in the victim's stomach to start with. With respect, sir, I would not call it a maverick test. One final question, Dr. Harper. Supposing just one mushroom of another species with a higher concentration of muscarine was ingested with the others, accidentally, that is, would this not increase the likelihood of a fatality? Yes. But in Mrs. Holland's case, no other species was ingested. I carried out a full microscopic examination of the stomach contents. All of the mushrooms were of the same type, Inus ivy patuiardi. Assuming no other species had been ejected from the stomach? Yes, assuming that. Are you Professor Maud Binney, and you live at 3 The Willows, Fulchester? Yes. Could you tell the court your occupation, please? I'm head of the botany department at Meadow Park College, where I lecture chiefly in mycology, that is, fungi. Uh, would you cast your mind back, please, to the early hours of the 26th of September last year? Happily. I was called to Fulchester Hospital to help in an emergency. They wished me to identify a species of mushroom. The unfortunate woman had died by the time I got there, regrettably. But I took the specimen back to my laboratory at Meadow Park College, where I identified it as Inocybe petuiardii, that is, the red staining Inocybe. And did you consort with Dr. Harper from the Forensic Science Laboratory later that day? I did. I gave him back the mushroom to help him with his experiments. Are you also acquainted, Professor Binney, with a species of fungi known as the St. George's mushroom? Yes. It's a perfectly delicious edible species. And in your expert opinion, are these two species, the red-staining Inocybe and the St. George's mushroom, easily confused? Only in the young fruit body stage. This is the stage when the cap has just opened like an umbrella, and then only by a very careless collector. Well, we do have photographs of these species. May Professor Binney also see them? We also have copies for the court. I should point out that these are not photographs of the actual mushrooms pertaining to the case but are intended only as a guide to their usual appearance, whole and in cross-section of both mushrooms at this stage of growth. Uneaten specimens of the red-staining Inocybe will not appear as an exhibit, as it has had to be dried out in order to be preserved, and this uh, greatly alters its appearance. What are the differences at this stage? Well, first of all, the smell. The red-staining Inocybe has the most unpleasant smell, like a musty cellar, damp. The St. George's mushroom has a nice smell, like baking flour. You can also tell the difference by looking at the gills. They are the radiating scales beneath the cap. They join the stem in quite different ways. The red-staining Inocybe has adnate gills. They join the stem quite horizontally. But the St. George's mushroom has sinuate gills. They curve down and away from the stem. And are those distinctions visible to the naked eye? Perfectly visible. 
But there are other more important differences. For instance, habitat. The St. George's mushroom grows on chalky grasslands. The red-staining Inocybe grows along the edge of paths in beech woods. Then there is the season. The St. George's mushroom does not grow in the autumn. It is a spring mushroom. The red-staining Inocybe grows from May right through to November. And would you go out in the last week of September and expect to find a St. George's mushroom? Certainly not. It is a spring species. Well, that's why it's called St. George's mushroom. Traditionally, it pops up on St. George's Day. And would an experienced mycologist know this? If he gathers them for food, he bally well ought to. What other differences are there? The red staining Inocybe stains red the moment it is touched or bruised. That's why it's called the red staining Inocybe. The St. George's mushroom does not. And do these stains develop immediately? Oh, within seconds. The test is infallible. Professor Binney, would the red staining Inocybe stain merely after being picked? Certainly. You can't pick a mushroom without touching it, and that touch alone would be enough. I see. Thank you, Mr. Markson. My lord. What other tests should one make? Well, there is one test that no serious mycologist would omit to make. That is the taking of a spore print. Could you uh, explain that to the court, please? If you cut the cap off a mushroom and place it gills downward on a sheet of white paper, the spores drop out. They're the equivalent of pollen in green plants. If you perform this test with the red staining Inocybe, you would see quite clearly that the spores are brown. Those of the St. George's mushroom are white. And would an experienced mycologist be aware of this test? My dear man, it's the first test in identification any mycologist learns. May Professor Binney be shown Exhibit 2, please? Now, you were asked to study a field book belonging to the defendant. Is that the field book? It is indeed. And have you studied it thoroughly? I have. Could you tell the jury what it contains? Excellent drawings of over 200 species of fungi, comprehensive notes on their structure, spore prints, and in most cases, a successful attempt at naming the species. And in your opinion, from reading his field book and studying his method of work, what kind of mycologist is the defendant? A very dedicated one. Is that someone who would take great care in identifying a species? It is, yes. And could such a mycologist possibly confuse the red-staining Inocybe and the St. George's mushroom? It would be highly unlikely. Could such a mycologist make that mistake with ten separate mushrooms? No, that would be impossible. Finally, Professor Binney, would you expect to find a group of ten red-staining Inocybes growing together? It is a relatively rare species. I would not expect to find more than two or three together. If you wanted to pick ten, what would you have to do? Search for them, if I could find that many. Thank you, Professor Binney. Professor Binney, I wonder if you could make it clear for the jury just exactly what a field book is. A mycologist keeps a field book so that he can record his finds. And in that field book, has the defendant recorded either of the two species which are under discussion? No. And what would you conclude from that? That he had not come across them yet. And aren't mistakes more likely to be made with unfamiliar species? Not if one is familiar with the means of identification. Well, can we explore these uh, points of difference? The difference in smell. In a young fruit body, would that be fully developed? Not as fully developed as in a mature specimen, but still noticeable. Provided one had a good sense of smell. Of course. Now, let's come to the gills. How would one normally look at them? The usual method is to make a cross-section by cutting it down the middle. Would you use a knife to do that? Yes, or a razor blade. Now, if you used a blunt knife, isn't it possible that one might damage the gills? It's possible, but it would be very careless. And isn't it possible that they might tear instead of being adnate or horizontal, look torn or curved? It could happen. Thank you. Can we turn to the habitat, Professor Biddy? You said that St. George's mushroom grew on chalky grassland while the Inocybe grows along paths in beech woods. That's right. Correct me if I'm wrong, but don't beech woods grow on chalky soil? Quite right. Would it not be possible to find an overlap site, say on the very edge of a beech wood, where trees and grassland meet? I have never found 
a red-staining inosibe along the edge of a wood. But yes, it's possible. Thank you. The court will hear in due course that the name of the wood is Downswood. Have you ever searched for fungi yourself in that locality? No, I'm afraid I haven't. I will come to the season in a moment. Is it not possible that the red-staining inosibe might not develop red stains until some time after picking? No, that is impossible. And if you cut one down with a blunt knife, the red staining would be very heavy indeed. But if one was in the shade of a wood or the light was poor, might that redness be missed? One would have to be blind. But isn't it nevertheless possible for a mycologist to miss something that is very obvious, simply because he's looking for so many things? I have never known anyone miss red stains on white mushroom flesh. Very well, can we come to the season? You say the St. George's mushroom is not found in the autumn. Yes. How would a mycologist know this? A mycologist has field guides to refer to. May Professor Binney be shown exhibit three, please? This is the Greenway Guide to Mushrooms and Other Fungi, is it not? That's what it says. Would you please turn to page 36 for me? It is marked. And read aloud what it says about the growing season of St. George's mushroom. April to June may also be found in autumn. So going by that guide, one would expect to find it in the autumn. Now, does that surprise you? No, because this is a Czechoslovakian translation. It's written in English, but the information pertains to mushrooms that grow in Czechoslovakia. And yet it is published in this country. Yes, it ought not to be. There are many regional variations. Mr. Canty, is this book generally on sale? Yes, my lord. I have seen it in three shops in Fulchester. I see. Thank you, Mr. Canty. Thank you, my lord. Professor Binney, do you consider that a reliable field guide is essential when it comes to a correct identification? Yes, but not this one. Well, would you turn to the next marked page, please? That's page 70. Now, that page shows the red staining inosibe. Am I right? Yes, quite clearly. Now, what symbol is used throughout that book to denote a poisonous species? A red skull and crossbones. And what symbol is used to denote an edible one? A black knife and fork. What symbol is beside the red staining inosibe? A black knife and fork. Well, it's a misprint. Now, would you not agree with me that if one did not know this species was poisonous, one would not be alerted to its characteristics. One would notice them. But one would not be alerted. Put that way, no. The jury will hear in due course that this was the field guide most frequently used by the defendant, Arthur Holland. The case of the Crown versus Holland will continue tomorrow in the Crown Court. The case you're about to see is fictional, but the procedure is authentic. The characters are played by actors, but the jury is selected from members of the public. Yesterday, the jury heard the first stages of the prosecution case against Arthur Holland, who was accused of the murder of his stepmother, Mrs. Marjorie Holland. <coughs> are you Stephen Andrew Holland, and you live at 17 Bridal Way, Fulchester? Yes. What relation are you to the defendant, Arthur Holland? Father. Could you tell the court where you were on the night of your wife's death on the 25th of September last year? In Durham. I had business at the British Computers Fair. I'm a commercial exhibition and trade fair display advisor. And it was while staying in Durham that you received a telephone call from Fulchester Hospital, am I right, saying that your wife had passed away? That's what they said. Could you make it clear to the court that she was your second wife? Yes, I first died three years ago. Well, I know this will be painful for you, Mr. Holland, but uh, believe me, these questions are necessary. 
How soon after the death of your first wife did you remarry? Six months. Uh, Mr. Holland, Mr. Holland, this is not a court of morals. Counsel is simply trying to establish family background, that's all. Mr. Markson. My lord. How did you meet her? I had business in Birmingham at the Ideal Homes exhibition. She was a professional demonstrator. <coughs> she demonstrated food mixers. And how soon after this did you marry her? Three days after. We got married there in Birmingham. I didn't want to be a widower for the rest of my life. A lot happened. Did Arthur meet her before the wedding? No. Did you tell him about it before you took her home? No. I wanted it to be a surprise. Well, how did he react when he met her? He sulked a great deal. Wouldn't speak to her. Shut himself in his bedroom. Got hysterical when I tried to reason with him. How old was the new Mrs. Holland? 26. And how old was Arthur at the time? He was 15. Did it surprise you that uh, he resented her presence in the house? No, but I was disappointed. She wasn't a young, attractive girl. I wouldn't have done that. After all, I didn't want to create problems. She was just a loving person. Did you have any cause to think that she disliked your son? No, like I said, she was a loving person. She gave up her work to come and care for the house, to look after us. You can't ask much more than that. So for you, this was a whirlwind romance, but for your son, it was an unacceptable intrusion. My lord, I must object. Yes, yes, quite. You are leading the witness, Mr. Markson. I'm sorry, my lord, I was merely trying to encapsulate the situation. Were you indeed? Pray continue. Thank you, my lord. Now, it's known that your son was a keen mycologist and that he studied mushrooms and other kinds of fungi. When did he take up this hobby? About a month after I brought Marjorie home. And where did he mostly pursue it? In his bedroom, at night. He brought home toadstools and cut them up. Did you encourage him with his hobby? No, I did not. I told him it was an unhealthy hobby for a boy of his age. And did your wife encourage him with this hobby? Not that I ever noticed. Did he ever tell you what he found so fascinating about mushrooms? I asked him once. I said, why do you bring rubbish home? He said, if I could bring Marjorie home, he could bring home bits of rubbish too. That hurt me. Very deeply. Did he ever give you a real explanation? No. Was he in the habit of eating the mushrooms that he brought home? Yes, he tried to get me to eat them. The thought made me feel sick. What about Mrs. Holland? Did she eat them? She did, yes. Raw? Yes. On roughly how many occasions? About a dozen times. I can't say exactly. Well, how did he make her do this when you were so clearly repulsed, Mr. Holland? He just put them in front of her, said they were an edible species, and she took his word for it. Did she never express a fear that they might be poisonous? She may have done the first time, but Arthur said that he'd studied them carefully to make sure they weren't. She trusted him. Did you ever watch how he studied them carefully? No, he did it in his bedroom. Did he ever mention the names of those edible species? No, I didn't take any notice of that either, I'm afraid. One final question, Mr. Holland. Were you ever present on an occasion when Arthur gave her mushrooms and yet ate none himself? No. Never. Thank you, Mr. Holland. Mr. Holland, I confess I am a little baffled. You said that Arthur sulked a lot, wouldn't speak to his stepmother, and yet here he is, sharing mushrooms with her while you do not. I put it to you, the resentment must have been very short-lived. Must it? Mr. Holland, it is counsel who is asking the question. Well, yes, it might appear that way. It does appear that way, Mr. Holland. I don't believe it was short-lived. You believe that he shared his mushroom finds with her, even though he resented her presence in the house? Yes. I suggested a very strange way of showing his resentment. You also said that you'd never noticed your wife encourage Arthur with this hobby in any way. That's correct. Yet here she is, allowing herself to be experimented on in a field about which she knew nothing, in complete faith. Wouldn't you call that a form of encouragement? In a way, I suppose. I put this to you, Mr. Holland. It seems from your evidence that Arthur enjoyed quite a good relationship with his stepmother. Almost cosy. 
Think that if you like. I'm the one that had to live with him. Mr. Holland, please bear in mind that the jury are not in that privileged position. I'm sorry. Let me ask you in another way. Did you have any reason to think that in a short space of time their relationship hadn't become amicable? None that I can put my finger on. It's just something you feel when you live with a person. I'm afraid your feelings aren't good enough, Mr. Holland. How is the jury to know they aren't imaginary? Do you think I imagined the looks he used to give her? Is that all you can offer? Looks? Standing here? Yes. Were you aware that she ever suffered ill effects after eating the fungi Arthur brought home? No. So, on roughly a dozen occasions, you saw her eat fungi which Arthur gave her, and on none of these occasions did she suffer any illness whatsoever. Is that right? She died of it on the last occasion. What would you call that if it wasn't suffering? I'm talking about previous occasions. He made her trust him, didn't he? Mr. Holland, would you please not make unconfirmed allegations and statements? We are not concerned with what you believe your son to have done, only with what you observed him to have done. I've tried to make that clear before. Yes, Your Honour. I understand that this is an upsetting time for you, but the law cannot allow emotions to override facts. The jury will kindly disregard that last remark. Mr. Canty. Thank you, my lord. What do you want to happen to your son when this trial is over? I want the best for him, of course. What do you call the best for him? I want him put away. Even if the jury decides he is innocent of this charge, he still needs help. You're not a psychiatrist, sir. How do you know he needs help? A boy that studies fungi for a hobby, mushrooms and toadstools, is that natural? You tell me, Mr. Holland. Oh, really, my lord, this evidence is becoming quite whimsical. Yes, yes, um, uh, Mr. Canty. My lord, in all my years at the bar, this is the first time I've ever come across a father willing to testify against his own son. I'm trying to establish a basic prejudice. Yes, I think you have already succeeded in doing that. With your permission, my lord, I'd like to discover the true nature of this prejudice. Oh, really, my lord, the witness is bound to be bitter. He's lost two wives, his son is charged with murder. Well, what man in those circumstances could be expected to be anything else? Yes, but bitterness is not prejudice, Mr. Markson. I don't object to your continuing, Mr. Canty, for the moment. Thank you, my lord. You say you want your son put away, Mr. Holland. Is that the reason for your constant assertion that Arthur resented his stepmother? He's my son. I'm only being truthful. He's your son, yet you want him found guilty. Wouldn't you expect a father to offer at least some defense of his own son? Under normal circumstances. Would I be right in saying that since the charge was brought, the relationship between yourself and your son has completely broken down? Yes. And that indeed he has not been living at home, but is in the care of Fulchester Roman Center. That's right. Have you ever once visited him there? No. Have you been living alone, or have you formed another attachment? Just answer yes or no. I don't wish to pry. Yes, I have formed another attachment. I don't think I need question you any more on the breakdown of the relationship. One final point and I don't wish to be disrespectful to your late wife, but she did have a weight problem, didn't she? Yes. And she was a compulsive eater. It was a problem with her, yes. Did she enjoy her food, particularly large meals? Yes, but I don't see what this has to do with... When she got used to the idea of eating the fungi that your son prepared for her, did she eat heartily as she would any other dish? Yes. It was one thing that Marjorie did enjoy. A food. Thank you, Mr. Holland. Just a couple of points, Mr. Holland. Uh, this remark your son made about uh, bringing the rubbish home, would you uh, please repeat it to the court? Yes. Uh, he said if I could bring Marjorie home, he could bring home bits of rubbish too. And when did he say this? About a few weeks after I brought Marjorie home and shortly after he took up his mushroom hobby. Do you have any reason to, to think that he changed his opinion? None. Finally, Mr. Holland, you, you said your wife was a professional demonstrator. Now, did she ever dispense uh, free samples of food at exhibitions? Yes, she was once Miss Gowder. Yes, well, what were her qualities as a demonstrator? Well, she was jolly. She could make people stay and listen. She always had a smile for people. 
Well, in spite of her hearty appetite, was she generous and unselfish when it came to food and sharing food? Yes. She was a wonderful person in every way. Thank you, Mr. Holland. I have no further questions, my lord. Thank you, Mr. Markson. Ms. Holland, you, uh, you may leave the witness box. Is your name Diana Rushton, and do you live at 9 Crane Park Avenue, Fulchester? Yes. And are you a pupil at St John's Road School, Fulchester? Yes. Prior to September the 25th last year, what was your relationship with the defendant? I suppose you'd say we were friends. Miss Rushton, what exactly do you mean by that? We were friends, that's all. There was nothing between us. I don't think he was interested in sex. Yes, well, we don't want to know what you thought, only what your relationship was, Mr. Markson. My lord, on that evening last year, when it was now established that uh, Mrs. Holland was at home dying from having eaten poisonous mushrooms, did you meet the defendant? Yes, we played chess together. Could you tell the court, please, what happened in your own words, starting from the time that you met? We met at half past seven in the school. Uh, this is St. John's Road School, the, the one you both attended. Yes, it was a school chess club. You see, Arthur was teaching me to play. I see. Carry on. Anyway, I was just setting up the board for our first game when he said that he had found this new species of mushroom. He told me that he tried it on Marge, his stepmother. Then he said, who knows, I might have poisoned her. Are you sure he used those exact words? Absolutely. Well, it's not the sort of thing you say, is it? Are you sure he said, tried it on Marge? Yes. Well, how did you react? I told him not to be so nasty. He was mad on mushrooms. They used to call him fungus head at school. And what did he say in reply? He didn't say anything else. How many games of chess did you play? Four. He won them all. Had you played many games of chess with him? Yes, we often played in class. He was teaching me, like I said. Did he play his usual game this particular evening, or did you notice any lack of concentration? No. No, he didn't play his usual game this particular evening, or no, you didn't notice any lack of concentration? Arthur always thought out about six moves in advance. Please just answer my question, Miss Rushton. He concentrated. After those games of chess, what did you do? We left the school and went home. And this was at what time? Ten o'clock. Are you certain? Yes. Well, we've been told that he, uh, that he didn't ring the doctor until five minutes to midnight. I'm certain. Did you walk any distance together? No, we both live in opposite directions. Did he say anything to you that led you to believe that he might not be going straight home? No. There's nothing to do in Fulchester after ten o'clock. Finally, Miss Rushton, when did you hear about Mrs. Holland's unfortunate death? It was in the newspaper the next night. And what was your course of action? I mentioned to my mother what he had said to me and she Well, said, don't tell me what she said, but as a consequence of your discussion, did you go to Fulchester Police Station and make a statement containing this information? Yes. Thank you, Miss Rushton. Will you please wait there? Miss Rushton, let me ask you first about this remark. Who knows I might have poisoned her? Did it alarm you? Yes. Yet you played four games of chess afterwards. I didn't take it seriously. It alarmed you, but you didn't take it seriously. I suggest, therefore, that you took it as a joke. At the time. I also suggest that when you read about Mrs. Holland's death the next day, you attached more significance to that remark than it merited. I don't know what you mean. Well, if I say to someone, drop dead, be it an anger or jest, and the very next day the person dies, doesn't my remark take on a more sinister meaning than I intended? He didn't say drop dead, though. Quite, Miss Rushton. Who knows I might have poisoned her? Sounds a much stranger thing just to say on its own. He said, I found this new species of mushroom and tried it on Marge. Who knows I might have poisoned her? Yet you took it as a joke. Yes. So I put it to you that he must have said it in a joking manner. The malevolent-sounding jape 
rather than the bland statement of fact. I can only repeat what he said. I can't rem remember in the way he said it. I see. Now you said you left the school at 10 o'clock. Could it have been later? There's a clock on the school wall. It said 10. Well, isn't it possible that you stood around for a while chatting? What about? What do you normally chat about? Nothing. All he was ever interested in was mushrooms and chess. He left the school and so did I. What was the weather like? It was fine. Was it a pleasant night? I mean, was it a pleasant night for a walk, say? Yes, I suppose it was. Because I put it to you that he said, I don't want to go home yet. Let's go for a walk around town. We were just friends. He had no reason to suggest that. It was because you are friends I put it to you that he might have. Thank you, Miss Rushton. My lord, it is my intention to call this defence witness before the defendant. I know it's not normal procedure, my lord, but Dr. Reeve has to fly to America tomorrow to attend a conference. Well, Mr. Markson has no objections? None, my lord. You better make a start then, Mr. Canty, haven't you? Thank you, my lord. Thank you, Leonard Friend. Are you Dr. Mark Reeve and are you the resident psychiatrist at Her Majesty's Remand Centre in Fulchester? I am. How many times have you seen and spoken to the defendant, Arthur Holland, prior to this appearance in court? Three times, once on the 12th of October and once on the 5th of December last year and also once on the 22nd of February of this year. How many hours would that constitute altogether? A total of six and a half hours. Can I ask you what conclusions you drew about him? Well, firstly, that he was a highly intelligent boy, quick to learn, and with a very clear awareness of what he'd done. The first time I interviewed him, I found him sulky and resentful about being locked up, as he put it. After that, however, the relationship improved. He became more cooperative. Except when I asked him about his family, particularly his father, he would then become very withdrawn, almost reluctant to admit what he felt. Did you discover why? Eventually. He had been very attached to his real mother, who died suddenly in March 79, more so than to his father. He deeply resented his father for remarrying some six months later, feeling that it drove an even greater wedge between them. You say he resented his father. Did you gain any impression that he resented his stepmother as well? None. Ironically, he got on much better with her. The fact that she was only 11 years older than him enabled him to build up more of a brother-sister relationship. This, to some degree, compensated for the absence of maternal love and care. From these interviews, did you conclude that he was suffering from anything? Well, there was no evidence of any mental illness and certainly none of subnormal intelligence. I uh, searched for signs of a personality disorder, the kind of disorder that might have caused him to commit a seriously irresponsible or aggressive act, but I could find no sign of any persistent disorder. What do you mean by persistent? Well, personality traits such as Obsessionality, aggressiveness, social conscience are only of concern when one or more can be measured in the extreme. The defendant showed no extreme traits. Did you find any evidence that he had failed to adjust to his father's remarriage in a responsible way? None. Finally, in your opinion, Dr. Reeve, is it in his personality to commit an aggressive act, one which he knows will result in the death of another person? In my opinion, it is not. Thank you, Dr. Reeve. Dr. Reeve, you say that you spoke to the defendant for a total of six and a half hours. Yes. Is that a long enough time in which to form a judgment? In my opinion, it is. Even though the interviews are conducted with wide intervals in between? Oh, yes, interviewing at such intervals helps to form a better judgment than if the interviews are squashed together over a short time. Isn't it nevertheless possible for the interviewee to pull the wall down over the psychiatrist's eyes, as it were, to fool him into thinking something that he wants him to think? It has happened, yes. Especially when the interviewee has a considerable degree of intelligence. If Arthur had been fooling me, I would have been aware of it. The kind of intelligence needed to fool an observant psychiatrist is often counterbalanced by a lack of good judgment in giving answers. In other words, the patient gives himself away. What is the psychiatric term for a person who shows those persistent disorders of personality. If those disorders lead to distress in others, he's called a psychopath. 
Did you not say that obsessionality is one such sign? Yes. How would you describe his rather consuming interest in fungi? Well, frankly, as a hobby. An obsessive hobby? I wouldn't call an obsessive hobby such a sign. The husband who plays obsessively with his son's train set is not a psychopath. Is not callousness an indicator of a psychopathic personality? Extreme callousness, yes. What about lack of remorse? Lack of shame? Those are signs, yes. Well, I, I put this to you, Dr. Reeve, but not once have you said that the defendant expressed shame over what he had done. Well, with respect, I was not asked. You were asked for your findings, Dr. Reeve. Do you not consider remorse and shame important enough findings? I found that Arthur was well aware of what he'd done. Aware, yes. But was he sorry? Did he cry? Did he express sorrow for his father? He did not cry and he did not express sorrow for his father because he does not like his father. Well, would you not refer to that as extreme callousness? No. I would refer to it as a breakdown within a family. Are you telling this court that uh, if a boy does not like his father, he feels no guilt whatsoever when he accidentally kills his father's wife? No, I'm saying that he feels sorrier for himself than he does for his father. Oh, he feels sorry for himself, does he? Well, I suppose that is a form of sorrow. Now, the reason Arthur was reluctant to talk to me at first about his relationship with his father was because he felt ashamed of it. That is a form of remorse. Can we talk about badness, then, instead of madness? Yes, if you'd care to define badness for me. Well, I suggest this seriously irresponsible act could have been nothing more than sheer mischief, an act of pure wickedness, a doing of evil. Was that not in his personality? It was not in his personality to be seriously irresponsible. Oh, come along now, Dr. Reeve. Are not all teenagers prone to the odd malicious act without total regard for the consequences? Yes, but your distinction between madness and badness is one I can't bridge. And why is that? Because you're trying to say that he did something evil. And that is something about which I'm not qualified to speak. The case of the Crown versus Holland will be concluded tomorrow in the Crown Court. The case you're about to see is fictional, but the procedure is authentic. The characters are played by actors, but the jury is selected from members of the public. During the past two days, the jury has heard evidence concerning the alleged murder of Mrs. Marjorie Holland by her stepson, Arthur. Mrs. Holland died from eating poisonous mushrooms. Today, the jury will return their verdict. Are you Arthur Holland, and do you live at 17 Bridalway, Fulchester? Yes, sir. On the 25th of September last year, were you attending St. John's Road School in Fulchester? Yes, sir. After school that day, what did you do? I went picking mushrooms in Downs Wood. It's a wood about half a mile from where I live. Is this the wood backing out of the fields at Sandbridge Farm, just north of Fulchester? Uh, yes, sir. May the defender be shown Exhibit 4, please? Thank you. Now, that is a map of Downs Wood. How often did you go there to pick mushrooms? Uh, about once a week. Did you consider it a good place for mushroom hunting or it, not? It was the best place I knew near to where I lived. How well acquainted were you with the different species that grow there? Very well acquainted. What happened that day? I searched around for about an hour looking for species I hadn't come across before. I found what I thought were St George's mushrooms lying in a group at the edge of the wood but uh, in the grass, away from the trees. Had you ever come across St. George's mushrooms before? No, sir. How did you recognize them? They looked like the picture in my field guide. I knew they were a spring mushroom, but the field guide did say they also grew in autumn. Which field guide was that? It was the Greenway Guide to Mushrooms and Other Fungi. How often did you use that particular guide? All the time. It's the one I rely on. 
Were you aware that it is a foreign translation, that, that much of the information pertains not to fungi in this country, but in fact to fungi in Czechoslovakia? No, sir. You expect field guides to be correct. And how does that field guide warn you about species which are poisonous? Uh, they're marked with the red skull and crossbones. Refer to the map, please. Now, where did you find this uh, group of mushrooms? Uh, on the east side, near to where the path starts. And how many were there? I can't remember exactly. I think nine or ten. And what did you do? Well, first I noted what the field guide said. St George's mushrooms grow in groups. Then I measured them all with my ruler. They were all about the same size. The caps were three or four centimetres. The size was right. Then I smelt them all. They smelt like flour. The field guide said St George's mushrooms smell like flour. Do you have a keen sense of smell? Uh, normally, yes. I had a bit of a cold this day. Uh, let me stop you there for a moment. Are you aware now that the mushrooms were in fact not St George's, but red staining Inocybes, a deadly poisonous species? Yes, sir. At that time, were you acquainted with the red staining Inocybe? No, sir. Had you ever read about it or about its characteristics? No, sir. Is that the truth, Arthur? Yes, sir. Carry on. What did you do next? I uh, cut one of the mushrooms down the middle with my penknife to look at the gills. They appeared to be sinuate, curved. St George's mushroom has sinuate gills. How many mushrooms did you make this test on? Oh, just the one. As the field guide said they grew in groups, I assumed they were all the same. May the defender be shown exhibit five, please. Is that the penknife you used on that occasion? Yes, sir. Thank you. We're sure to the jury, please. Now, when you cut this mushroom down the middle, did you cut it all the way? Yes, sir. And did you notice any discoloration at all? No, sir. Well, are you aware now that the red staining Inocybe gets its name from the fact that within seconds of being cut, it stains red? I am now, sir, yes. And what time of day was this? It was about six o'clock. And you were on the east side of the wood. What was the light like? Dull. I was in the shade. But I could see, and my eyesight is perfectly good. And what did you do next? I picked all the mushrooms, put them in my basket, and took them home. With what intention? Eating them, and sharing them with Marge, my stepmother. How often did you do this? I did it quite often. I'd actually done it about 12 times. If you knew they were edible, why didn't you eat one there? I don't like eating any fungus until I've washed it. Well, what did you do when you got home? I went upstairs to my room. I put one of the mushrooms into a wax paper bag to keep it fresh. I was in a hurry to get out. I was meeting Diana to play chess. I thought I'd record it in my field book later. Then I got changed to go out. Uh, where was Marge at this time? She was downstairs watching TV. I came down, saw that uh, it was seven o'clock, said I've got to rush. There are some mushrooms in my basket in the kitchen. They need washing. Save some for me. Then I rushed out. Why were you in such a rush? I had to be there for half past seven. It takes half an hour to walk. Well, why couldn't you have taken a bus? I walk. I, I, I always do. I like it. Besides, the buses don't always come. Quite. So you went to the school chess club where you met Diana Rushton. What did you say to her that night? I made some joke about maybe having poisoned Marge. But it was a joke. Honest. What prompted such a joke? I don't know. It was just a bit of fun. <laughs> She'd eat anything, nuts and bolts, if you gave them to her. <laughs> Do you think if I'd uh, deliberately poisoned her, I'd have spoken about it? What time did you leave, Diana? Ten o'clock. And what did you do? I uh, looked around the town. It was a nice night. I wanted her to come with me, but she said she had to go home. And why did you not go straight home? I like the atmosphere. The streets are quiet. There's never any reason for going straight home anyway. I looked in shop windows. And what time did you eventually arrive home? A bit before 12. I saw Marge at the foot of the staircase. I thought she'd fallen, hit her head or something. I didn't think it was because of the mushrooms. I, I had no reason to. And what did you do then? I called the doctor. He said to phone for an ambulance, which I did. When Dr. Belmore arrived and you showed him the mushroom you'd put aside, did you notice anything in particular about it? Yes, sir. It had become stained with red. Was that honestly the first time that you had noticed such stains? Yes, sir. 
One final question. What were your feelings towards your stepmother? I liked her. She was what Dad wanted. Thank you, Mr. Holland. Would you wait there, please? Mr. Holland, you say that you knew the fungi which grew in Dan's wood very well. Yes, sir. Did you also know that the red staining Inocybe grew there? No, sir. I suggest that's a lie, Mr. Holland. I suggest that you knew perfectly well that the red staining Inocybe grew there and that you deliberately picked that species in order that it might be confused with the St. George's mushroom. I've never heard of the red staining Inocybe. Is that so? May the defendant be passed exhibits three, please, plus exhibits six to ten. Do all those field guides belong to you? Yes, sir. How long have you possessed them? A couple of years. Would you look at the uh, Hamilton Guide to British Fungi and turn to page three of the introduction, please? Would you please read to the court the passage which begins, Beware picking small mushrooms? Beware picking small mushrooms. Many edible species resemble poisonous ones. Go on. For instance, St. George's mushroom has often been confused with Inocybe petriardii, the red staining Inocybe, which contains deadly amounts of muscarine. Don't you find it rather a coincidence that those are the two very mushrooms that we're discussing? No, sir. Please read the next sentence. The red staining Inocybe, however, stains red when it is touched or bruised. St. George's mushroom does not. And you still maintain that you've never heard of the red staining Inocybe? Despite the fact that in all but one of your field guides, the Greenway Guide, there are pictures of it and a clear warning about it? Yes, sir. Well, don't you read your field guides? They're for reference. They're not novels. Well, don't you refer to them, then? Yes, sir, but only when I find a species I've never come across. I'd never found the red staining Inocybe, had I? So I had no reason to look it up. Beware picking small mushrooms. Is that a warning you're familiar with? Yes, sir. And weren't those small mushrooms? Yes, sir. Yet, you identified them as St. George's mushrooms simply by smelling them. Whilst, by your own admission, you had a cold, and by cutting one of them down the middle with a knife to look at the gills. Do you call that a positive identification? No. Then what positive test of identification did you apply, Mr. Holland? I didn't make one because I felt certain they were St. George's mushrooms. Isn't that rather a contradiction? I made a mistake. I admit it now. How long? Have you been studying fungi as a hobby? Over two years now. Well, I suggest, therefore, that you're very well versed in the means of identification. Yes, sir. And while you were prone, as we all are, to making the odd mistake, you would not normally make a whole catalogue of errors, would you? That's right. Well, let's come back to the real extent of that mistake in a minute. Let's, uh, let's look at the evidence of the experts, shall we? How many mushrooms did you say you picked? Nine or ten. Despite the fact that Dr. Harper, who's a man with specialist knowledge of mushroom poisoning, has told this court that approximately 25 would have to have been required to kill Mrs. Holland. Yes. Are you arguing with the experts in this field? I only pick nine or ten. And in a group, you say? Despite expert evidence that the red staining Inocybe is a relatively rare species, and that to pick ten, one would, in all probability, have to search for them. They were in a group, honestly. Well, I suppose you're only arguing with the laws of chance now. I'm not arguing with anybody. I'm just saying everybody's wrong. Is Professor Binney wrong when she tells you that the red staining Inocybe stains red when it is cut or bruised? No. Yet you managed to pick them all, cut one in half with a knife, put them in your basket, take them home, and miraculously none of them change colour. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Well, who are you arguing with now? Laws of nature? I suppose the next thing you'll be telling me is that the sky's red and the grass is yellow. Nature mutated for you alone. What I'm saying is I didn't notice them change colour. I put it to you that this whole story about making a mistake is a lie. I put it to you that you knew those were poisonous mushrooms. Is that not the truth? No, it isn't. Yet you can't give this court one reason why you felt certain they were edible ones. The field guide said St. George's mushrooms grew in autumn and that the red staining Inocybe didn't. The Greenway guide, yes. Why didn't you cross-check with the others? 
Isn't that the purpose of having them? I didn't think it was necessary. I suggest that you are deliberately choosing for your own defence the one book which you know contains wrong information. That's not true. I always use this book. Do you, do you agree that it contains fewer descriptive accounts of fungi than any of the other guides? So 100, in fact, compared with 900 in the Hamilton Guide? Yes. But what makes you use that one all the time? Why not use the one which is nine times more comprehensive? Because it's lighter. Oh, come along, Mr. Holland. Is this the answer of a serious mycologist? Because it's lighter. I only do it as a hobby. You say you don't like eating any fungi until you've washed it. Why didn't you eat one of the mushrooms when you got home? Like I said, there wasn't time. Well, how long does it take to wash and eat a mushroom? I asked Marge to leave some for me. I suggest you asked her nothing of the sort. I suggest you told her she could eat them all. That's not true. I asked her to leave some. Before you went out, did you, uh, did you make a spore print to determine the spore colour? No. Why not? Don't you consider it the most important test of identification? A test which, in this case, would have told you that the spores of these mushrooms were brown and that they could not have been St George's mushrooms? There wasn't time. I, I was in a hurry to get out. Do you normally eat mushrooms before you've made all the tests? No. Oh, but you cheerfully let your stepmother eat a number of mushrooms which you had not identified. I made a mistake. I was careless. I admit it now. Well, I suggest that this is precisely what you want us to think. I suggest that you made this remark to Diana Rushton, who knows, I might have poisoned her, out of an arrogant belief that you had committed a murder that couldn't be proved. Isn't that what you thought? No. I said it as a joke. Oh, really? Do you think it's funny? Not now, no. So, after looking in shop windows for an hour and a half, you arrived home and found your stepmother lying unconscious. Well, why didn't you ring the doctor? And not an ambulance. I didn't think. Well, I put it to you that having poisoned your stepmother, you set out to waste as much time as possible so that treatment would be delayed. Well, then why did I ring the doctor? Well, why didn't you tell him of the possibility of poisoning, when clearly she was salivating at the mouth, perspiring, and her pupils were constricted? Because I thought she'd fallen downstairs. Poison doesn't usually make people do that. It usually makes them fall down somewhere, Mr. Holland. Thank you, my lord. I have no further questions. Candy. Uh, thank you, my lord. Uh, why were you in such a hurry to go out that night, Mr. Holland? I was meeting Diana to play chess. Does she attract you? A bit, yes. Just remind the court of your age. The 17. I have no further questions, my lord. Members of the jury, the human body may be overcome in many ways, but surely the most detestable way is by poison. It strikes from the inside where the victim is least able to prevent its action. That's why it is often widely known as the coward's weapon. I submit to you that this was a cowardly murder. Let me remind you of the facts. Now, Dr. Harper, who is a specialist in mushroom poisoning, has told you that it would take approximately 25 mushrooms of this species to produce a fatality. Yet the defendant insists he only picked nine or ten. Yet Mrs. Holland died. Now, Professor Binney has told you that she would not expect to find more than two or three growing together, and that would be relatively rare. The defendant tells you he picked nine or ten in a group. Why? Because he could not have assumed that they were all the same if they'd been growing in different parts of the woodland. He also asked you to believe that he's never heard of the red staining Inosabi. Well, is this credible? He's been studying mushrooms for two years. It is clearly depicted in every one of his field guides, and indeed there's a warning against confusing it with the St. George's mushroom in the introduction to one of those guides. He puts the blame for his mistake about the season on a field guide which is wrong. Yet he has six other field guides which are quite specific. The St. George's mushroom is a spring not an autumn species. 
He tells you, however, that this is the field guide on which he most relies. Members of the jury, look at it. Compare it with the others. It is the least comprehensive of them all. Do you really believe that this is the one that he uses all the time? He tells you that he did not see red stains on any of the mushrooms. Well, I suggest that you look at his very own field book and decide for yourselves how observant a mycologist he was. Could he have missed the stains on all the mushrooms? Decide by looking at his own extensive notes how thorough a mycologist he was. Where are all those mistakes? All those oversights that he now freely admits to within the bounds of mere carelessness? For every mushroom in that field book, there is a spore print, the most important test of identification. Well, why did he omit to make one on such a crucial occasion as this? Consider the coincidence that this poisoning took place when his father was away on business. Now, you may feel that he had planned that so that uh, his stepmother would have no one in the house to help her. Why did he not eat one of the mushrooms? He said he was in a rush to get out. Well, members of the jury, how long does it take to put a mushroom in your mouth? This is a case which poses many mysteries. If the red staining Inocybe is so rare, how come the defendant was able to find nine or ten, let alone twenty-five? And given such rarity, isn't it natural to assume that they'd be growing close together rather than in different spots? And consider this approximation, the figure of 25 mushrooms. On what is it based? There were only 10 mushrooms found in Mrs. Holland's stomach. What she vomited up after feeling ill, we shall never know. The figure is based largely on the amount of muscarine needed to cause fatality, yet Research is far from complete on the actual amount in mushrooms. There are to add to this uh, regional variations which have yet to be studied. Given such uncertainties, ought we not to treat the figure with some suspicion? And if the boy had intended to poison his stepmother, why did he not choose a species where only one mushroom would have been enough? There are far more deadly species around than the red staining Inocybe. Why did he choose a species where so many were required, thus openly inviting suspicion? You might also like to consider this. If the mushrooms smelt that unpleasant and looked so unsightly, would Mrs. Holland have eaten them? Yet she did eat them. I ask you to consider as well the boy's age. He is not, as the prosecution would have us believe, an expert on mycology. Nor does he have any qualifications in medicine capable of recognizing the symptoms of muscarine poisoning. He saw his stepmother lying at the foot of the staircase and assumed she had fallen down them. What more natural assumption is there? And finally, there is the evidence of Dr. Reeve, the psychiatrist. Dr. Reeve says he can find no evidence of mental illness or of a personality disorder. In his opinion, the defendant does not have it inside him to commit such an act as murder. Medically speaking, it is not in his personality. Murder. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, or a lesson to us all in the dangers of complacency, I urge you most strongly to consider the latter and bring in a verdict of not guilty. Members of the jury, this is not a trial in which the question is, did the defendant wield the weapon or did he not? The question you must answer is, did the defendant bear malice of forethought or did he make a genuine error of identification? Now, if you conclude that the defendant knowingly administered poisonous mushrooms to his stepmother, but that having regard to the evidence concerning the nine or ten mushrooms, 
his intention was to make her ill and not to kill her, then you can bring in a verdict of manslaughter. If, however, you are satisfied that the defendant knowingly administered poisonous mushrooms to his stepmother and that his subsequent behavior, in particular telling the doctor that she had fallen down the stairs, points to an intention to kill rather than merely to make ill, then the verdict you bring in must be one of guilty to murder. Now, the second point I wish to make is this. The burden of proof rests squarely upon the prosecution. It is not enough to say that the defendant could have known of the existence of the red staining anosibi and that he could have planned this murder with that knowledge in mind. The prosecution must satisfy you that he did so. And now, let us turn to the family in this case. You have heard evidence regarding the relationships within that family. You may be left in some doubt as to the exact nature of the defendant's feelings towards his stepmother, as to what emotions he harbored deep inside. But I must tell you that it is not essential for the prosecution to provide a motive. And finally, you must judge this case upon the facts as they exist and as they have been presented to you. You will now retire, elect a foreman to speak for you, and consider your verdict. All stand. Members of the jury, will your foreman please stand? Answer this question, yes or no. Have you reached a verdict upon which you all agree? Yes. On the count of murder in the indictment, do you find the defendant, Arthur Holland, guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. On the count of manslaughter, as directed by his lordship, do you find the defendant, Arthur Holland, guilty or not guilty? Guilty. The judge passed a sentence of detention at Her Majesty's pleasure. This did not mean, he explained, that Arthur would necessarily spend the rest of his natural life in custody. It meant, he said, that from time to time the position would be considered, and Arthur released, if it became proper to do so. <laughs>